The question is asked by our first question, by me, how do you define eternal life? What is eternal life? Excuse me. Okay. Does it have a beginning? It's without beginning, and it's without end, right? That's hard for us to grasp, because everything we kind of involve ourselves with is the, is the beginning. For a long time, atheists were proud because they thought science dictated this, that, that the universe has always been. It is eternal. There's the, the matter that has always been eternal. But as looking at the stars and the expansion of our, of our universe that we have, including that's the space, our universe that we live in, they begin to realize that the universe is expanding and they begin to see by looking at the color of the stars and their, their light that they were giving back to us, though they may be uh, many light years away, that that was a red. That means they were, they were moving on. And that caused people like Einstein, who did not believe that at first, to admit before his death that indeed there was a beginning. And there had to be a, a beginning for this to be a, occurring. Something had to, to start so it, they could, as it continues to move on. And so for, for years, there was a sense, and I, I grew up, Going to college, uh, matter was eternal. That's exactly what it is. But all of a sudden, what came along? The Big Bang Theory. Why that? Because they realized the universe had a beginning. And therefore, let's take God out of it. It was a Big Bang. Something was, uh, had, had to occur to start things going. And so that's now considered to be, hey, we believe the Big Bang Theory. Well, what's that admitting? That it had a, excuse me, David. Well, I posed the question before the 80s, so what was there to explode? I mean, did we have 80s that fixed it up, or what was there to explode? Well, it came from the seeding of other planets. That's, that's one of the things. That, that life uh, was from other planets that always had been there, and it's seeded in our universe, and we, we had that. So that becomes outrageous, isn't it? We, uh, aliens is uh, involved in here. So little Marshmen come, Mars coming in here, Martians coming in here, and uh, bringing a little life, and all of a sudden we got it. But God is the beginning of life. But the point is, is that the question is asked, where did God come from? And our little children will say, well, you, all right, you had a beginning, God created them. Well, where did God come from? God's always been. That's hard to fathom, but we know that by faith. And something had to begin for things to begin. Well, uh, rocks didn't begin, and this earth didn't begin. You know, it, that wasn't the beginning of all things. But God, in his infinite wisdom, his omnipotent power, spoken into existence, and he is life. Therefore, life begets life. Where did it all begin? And the evidence we see around us points to the fact that there was a mindset, there was an intelligence that brought things into existence. Our bodies are created that way with DNA. All the little things have to work together for life to even occur. It just kind of evolved. Well, maybe it'll work for a while. And, the, and, and Mr. Woody Woodpecker, he, he kind of became where he didn't beat his brains out pecking a tree because he kind of over time formed this padding. Well, what about the word peck, pecker before that? You, you become extinct, acting like a woodpecker. But God designed things. And yes, we adapt to our circumstances, but we do not change into another species. And that's the battle with... Uh, atheists to say well, science is on our side and you can't even bring in the uh, idea of God because that's something you can't prove. Well, how do you prove the beginning? Y'all been all over the page in that and you're trying to find reasons for it. There is an all-powerful, all-wise God who brought life into existence according to his will 
And all things point to intelligent design, which means there's an intelligent design earth. And that's not hard to accept when you look at evidence and then you see God's word claim it. God's word has never taken a back seat to anything, although people want to avoid it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Simple statement. You, you've, got, you, you've got energy, you've got space, you've got time. You've got all of that beginning in that one verse, succinct, not a lot of details, not a lot of wordiness that I'm using right now. It's just, those are facts to think about. And there's nothing that we're seeing that would disprove that. But more and more, it is, is giving evidence that it's very hard to refute in the scientific world. And that battle is ongoing. And there are those who are determined to at least show that you may not, you know, you don't have to call him God. But there is something behind this, an intelligent designer, because we see how much things are designed for, for there even to be life upon this earth. And, and the, where we stand in our planet, how things were set. And uh, we'll just, we'll keep on believing that. But eternal life, that originates with God who is eternal. It's everlasting. And I hope I have it one day. What's John telling us? I hope I have it one day. I don't have it now. You don't? What does he say? These things I've written unto you. So writing this epistle is that you may know that you have. Present tense. Continues on. That you have what? Everlasting life. It's not the glorified state of everlasting life. But when we were raised from the dead, what life was that? It's eternal. And when Jesus says, I'm the resurrection of the life. He that believeth on me, <clears throat> though he die, like three of our brethren have this past week, they shall what? They shall live. They've died, all right, but they shall live. But he didn't stop there. He that believeth on me, means keeps on believing on me, shall never what? Shall never die. What is he talking about there? I'll never be separated from God spiritually. <clears throat> yes, we're going to die, and we're going to be raised from the dead, but he gives spiritual life, and we will never lose it. It will never come to an end, as long as we what? Keep on believing. It's not that what it's already set because I've been chosen and you haven't. Uh, you've got to work at it. Maybe you'll be chosen one day. Uh, no, we, the Christian should know he has that. And who is it even unto you that what? Believe on the name, the authority, the reality of who Jesus is. Believe on the name of whom? The Son of God. And this whole Gospel of John, showing his deity. He's the son of God. He was God, and then he was God in the flesh. Uh, his epistle, that, that indeed the word of life became flesh. We could touch it. We could hear him. Uh, it was in Christ that he is indeed the one that gives us life. And we believe on his name. And as long as we keep believing and keep living like we believe him we're living the life that he has we should know we have it i have it today i'll have it tomorrow i'll have it when i die and it's going to then transfer you know take the next step into eternal glory but what other life do you have that god gives us when we become a christian partial life you're just partially living the Bible never says it. It's, just, you, it's, it's life, and it's life eternal, John says. And I hope that encourages us to, to realize I should be living a life that I know I am saved. I know that I have eternal life. But as we see, he still warns us, doesn't he? Guard yourself from idols. Why is that? Because we can fall. We can quit believing. And that's, uh, that's how... That's why these epistles are written to equip the Christian 
so they will not fall, even though right now they, they have that. But they can, the door that opened up to eternal life, faith, we can close by unbelief. And we, we can take our choice. We can go our way. And uh, it won't change God, but it'll change our eternal destiny. And we want to know we have eternal life because we believe on the Son of God. And that faith in Him, you will never be ashamed. Meaning, He, he will fulfill His promises. And I think that's important because sometimes it's just a gamble. I wonder, uh, I'll put a wager of my soul. Which I, I think I'll just pick what would be wise. If, if God doesn't exist and the Son of God doesn't exist, heaven's not real, then, and I just died, then, hey, I won't, uh, nobody will know it. I, I won't know anything. But if he is, and I don't believe on his name and don't remain faithful, I don't understand as, if I'm wrong that I'm eternally damned. And you know what? I think I'll be a Christian. I, I think that would be the wisest thing to do. And that might be human philosophy. Pascal, that might be a way he, he dealt with Christians. Paul doesn't argue that way. If I've only believed in God in this life, it, I am a most pitiable creature if the resurrection doesn't occur. Think about that. No, no, Paul. If the resurrection doesn't occur, we'll never know it. Don't call me pitiable. I'm, I'm being wise. I'm a gambler, you know. Well, that's not, that's not part of being a Christian. That's not to bring people to Christianity. It's the fact that God puts it there. If Jesus has not been raised, what is it? Your faith is vain, and you're still in your sins, and you are people most pitiable for doing what you're doing this morning. If it's not real. And then why, it, it makes you think, if, well, if it's not real, just give it up. But the point is, it is real, and God says it's real, and you believe on him, you'll never be put to shame, 1 Peter 2. Because he will fulfill his promises. God is out there, said so you're going to have, if you're going to continue to have eternal life, you're going to have to have faith and trust in me. And I've told you, I do not lie. I've told you I am faithful to my promises. Let me tell you something, if you don't believe that Jesus that God has come in the flesh, you're going to die in your sins. If you don't believe that he was raised from the dead, you're going to die in your sins. You're going to have to believe. And we have all the evidence, just like we talked about how the universe came. We got the evidence of how we know we have e eternal life. Okay? Question number, number two. How can we know for certain we have eternal life? Okay, I got it. we had that question. You want to add anything to it? We believe on his, the name, the authority. He did, I, didn't, I don't believe that he existed. I believe on his name, upon the name of the Son of God, the authority. Whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, in the authority of the Lord. And because he's the foundation for our salvation, it's his death, it's his resurrection that gives us the confidence of our hope. So let's talk about our prayer. And this becomes very important, and, it, and it's a matter of life and death, too. Well, we know we have eternal life. Why are we worried about this? Because there's some brethren that can be sinning unto death. A brother in Christ who knows he has salvation can be sinning unto what? Death. Apparently, once you got it, it doesn't mean you can't lose it. But you need to know you have it. And all of a sudden, John begins to set forth. We have boldness. And the boldness which we have toward him, that we're, we're going to ask, what, what two facts give us the confidence in our prayer? What are they? Okay, that's one. What's the other one? When will he hear us? Ask how? According to his will. James will tell us that you ask but you don't receive because you want to spend it in your pleasures. We're to ask according to God's will. Where do we find his will? 
the same place I found the evidence to believe is the Word of God. How should we pray? How should we pray? One thing is according to His will, we, we pray. We just learned in chapter 3 that we do things that are pleasing in His sight, the idea of obeying His commandments. We know that we have, the, we, we know that He answers our prayer in that way as well. And that becomes an important too about our, our praying to the, to the Lord. But here is, is the fact that we pray according to His will. And when you do that, can you accept no? When you pray, you get a no? Not verbally maybe, but it just didn't seem to happen. Well, he, he answered Paul, and we can learn from him. He asked three times, but his throwing the flesh to go. He got a no. But he got something better to understand. When you're weak, Christ looks strong. And you're, you, you're okay with a no. Because he is a father of gifts that are perfect for us. He knows what we need when we might not be asking for what we need. We've already seen that the Holy Spirit, who knows the mind of the Christian, will intercede for us when we don't even know how, what to ask for. We saw that, we see that in the book of Romans, in Romans 8, that because it's tied in the Word of God. We, we know what God's will is, but we don't know exactly, I'm going through this very traumatic time, I don't know what the answers are to the things. I just pray if it be thy will. I would like this. And I think that's part of it, and he will answer uh, according to his will. That's how the Holy Spirit intercedes. He knows the mind of God. He knows your heart that you can't express today because you're so uh, down and, and uh, out of it. But you, your heart is needing something. He will, he will give expression to that according to God's will. Because God's going to work things out according to his will. So why do we pray? Because we trust in God. We need him every hour. That doesn't mean we have to have a crutch in life. But we have him to we realize he's, he's there to guide us and we want to do things according to his will. And God's servants and God's people will, will do that. So there's a certainty that he hears our prayer, accepts our prayer. If we pray according to his will, keep his commandments, we'll have what we ask for. So here he begins to get into a, a discussion of the one who is sinning unto death. Could you describe that person from the text here? What, what is, this is pretty serious. And what's, how does prayer relate to this? So let's, let's look at the passage. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever else, we know that we have the petitions which we've asked of him. Now. There's the, the confidence. We'll, we'll receive what he asks. If it's according to his will, we'll accept the no, knowing that he, he knows better, so forth. But here in verse 16, if any man see his brother, his fellow Christian, sinning a sin not unto death, he shall ask and God will give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, not concerning this do I say that he should make request. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So what is the one that's sinning not unto death first? And I'd like you to tell me how you sin and it's not unto death in light of Romans 6.23. Yeah. Well, why would I pray for a brother who's been forgiven? What's he doing in regard to his? He sinned, but it's not unto death. The point is, well, he's been forgiven. So what is he? I want to describe the one. He, he repented. He changed. To me, to me that's the it's a logical place to be. And if, there's nothing, anything that contradicts it. And I think it, it's essential of that taking place. 
We always think of the sin, well, what's not unto death? And, oh, there's a sin unto death. But the sin not unto death is the one that he's been forgiven. And notice what happens. When you sin a sin that not unto death, he shall ask, and what will God give him? He didn't sin unto death, but what does he need? No, he's dead. What, why, what, who, what does he give you? Life. Deal with that. And what I'm dealing with is that that, that life is getting right back with God, because you did sin, and the reason it's just not unto eternal death, and you lose your soul, is because you repented, and you're going to change. And that's according to God's will. But I will now restore you to a state of, of life, because if you continue in that sin that brings forth death and separation from God, if you continue in that, you will die eternally. So that's why I'm giving you life, because you did not sin unto eternal death. It's the only thing that makes sense. And I think it's exactly consistent with the Word of God. That we don't take sin lightly and realize if I stay in that condition, then I'm going to be... You know, I'll be separated from, from God and, 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 uh, for eternity. I don't want that. Uh, but I need life again. I need to be restored. And I don't want to remain in this condition. Simon the Sorcerer was a great example, I think, of this principle. He was told that you're in a bond of iniquity. You're, you're in the bond of iniquity. You're, you're in the gall, <laughs> gall, and, 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 and idea of, of, of things that are uh, bitter, bond of iniquity. You're there. And yet he prays that these things will not happen to him. I thought you're already there. You are. But what are you going to do about your sin? Because you're in a bond of iniquity, and one sin... You can die eternally with that one sin. And he said, I pray that won't happen to me. So we're in a state where part of the will of God is just like in 1 John 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from what? Well, I thought we walked in the light. What do you got? Walking in the light and walking in darkness? Uh, that's, no. no. Well, it's... It's I'm, I'm walking in the light because I'm doing something with my sin that I need forgiveness. Because that's part of walking in the light. We do sin. wonder if I stay in that sin. wonder if I ignore it. I will, I will, that will be unto eternal death. I think he opens up this section with life eternal in mind. And he deals with sin that we need to correct or it will issue into eternal death and will forfeit eternal life. That's why I said, well, why does prayer have to be done with knowing the Son of God? So I can see a brother, so you see a brother that's not sinning unto eternal death, but he needs forgiveness so he can have life in Christ. So he can restore that life that he, he, he uh, should have and have knowledge of it. What is the condition for forgiveness of sins? It's what does that brother do? God does the forgiveness. What does that brother do? Can you see that? <laughs> Can we see that when a brother comes forward, asks for the forgiveness of God and before my brethren, and would you pray for me? What can you do? Yeah, I'll pray for you. David?
Yeah, and, and of course we today need to understand that particular sin was attributing miraculous power to Beelzebub. And the whole point was, what was the purpose of miraculous power? It was confirmed without a doubt that what was happening was from God. And they could deny that it didn't come from God. But they were saying it's Beelzebub. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And now we, have, we don't have those miraculous gifts. That situation is not there. But that's, that's true. Let, let's say, because Mark will tell you it is an un, uh, unpardonable sin. It's an unforgiven sin. It's an unforgivable sin. Because, and that is in that text, that here was conf confirmation that it's from God. And you, it didn't say, well, I don't believe in, in Jesus Christ. Here was a confirmation about Christ, and you're not even going to acknowledge the reality of what a miracle meant. And that, that was the particular, the particular sin in that, in that context. But you're right that, that saying, wonder if you changed your mind in Acts the second chapter, David, and you were there and you're one of those people who denied, that said, well, his power came from Beelzebub and you repented and were baptized. Well, you can't be forgiven. And that might be a possibility, but also realize that we can turn from our sins. And now I do believe, and there were people who didn't believe in Jesus and crucified him that day that got forgiveness, didn't they, in Christ. So why would I want to come to Christ to make that step if I stay in that, that condition? Your point is, is, well, is well taken. But to me, this is what happens. So when I see there is a sin not unto death, Every sin takes us away from God. We don't want to stay there, so we, it'll issue into eternal death. But, uh, and the point is, I still need to be alive because if I stay in that sin, I'm going to be separated from God. But what we do when we sin, so I take sin seriously, and I don't, I don't pile it up. A month later, I'll ask for, I'll kind of go back and look over my life. No, you, you realize this is serious. I don't, my condition of, uh, is that I'm, I'm in a state that I could, I could lose my soul tonight if I don't get right with God. I want life back. I want it restored with me because I don't want to, it to be unto eternal death. And it's something I can observe. Now, one, you know, if a person's hypocritical and it doesn't believe, they'll show that and they'll show by their life if the repentance was true. But at that moment, I can see uh, and I, a brother can pray for a brother who is ready to turn back and turn from sin. Yes, sir. Yes, I think, I think that's, that's correct. But if we'll put in a complication thing for another passage. I, I, I need to pray for our, our brethren because he would have all, pray for others that they may be saved because he would want all men to be saved. But that's not praying that you forgive them right now. Right, right. So in this context. So I'm praying that prayer, but here's a brother and he, he's not going to change his life. I can't pray for him. But wonder if he asked you to. Well, we want to, we start, are you repenting? <laughs> and I think at that point, you, you got that. Yes, because if you see a brother sin, don't pray for him. So it's another, it's another brother. I was trying to think of an example I've ever had of, of uh, having to say, I can't pray for you. Because... <laughs> Most people, they're, they're, they're coming forward and they deal with, they're sorrowful for things, they, or they wouldn't want to be talking about the scriptures. So, uh, but there's a case where it shows the importance that it's not according to God's will if you're going, even with your imperfections, if you're, not going, if you're going to determine to stay in sin. So we, we have to come out, out of that. Yeah. This, excuse you me? Said, Well, if he won't repent, then you can't pray for him to be 
That's yeah. right. So I think that's where that needs to be. Yeah. It's not that he came to you or that he came to the congregation and asked for prayers. You saw the sin. But if he did, I've talked to people and uh, I can tell if they're going to repent or not. I mean, I've been in that situation. So, but your the point's right. That that's, that would be a, a case where in my prayers for them, I couldn't do that because they're not, they're not manifesting that for, for, uh, repentance. Um, I think we dealt with that. To whom does God give life when answering our prayer? To him that doesn't sin unto death. Well, every sin's, uh, thank you, every sin's unto death, but what it was, I'm repenting. And to me, uh, that's instructive. Because all unrighteousness is sin, and yet there is a sin not unto death, unto eternal death. And it's the one we repent of right now, so it doesn't issue into eternal death. And yet I need life. If I don't repent of it, I'm going to be separated from God forevermore. Now, the, the, the area that is difficult, do I jump in and out of fellowship with God? And 1 John 1 says not necessarily because I'm trying to, part of walking in the light right now is to have forgiveness of my sin. And if I confess it and, re, and, we, and repent of that, then uh, he's, he's able to forgive us. So we can continue our imperfect walk in the light. So it's not ideal. The moment I sin, I just jumped out of fellowship with God. It, it can, if I don't do something about it, then it shows you the importance of doing something about our sins when we sin and not and understand it. When that guilt hits us, we need to deal, deal rightly with it. How, how long did David ignore his sin? That's dangerous. He made excuses for it, blamed it on everybody else, but finally what did he do? He, he, he confessed it. And we need to be sensitive and be ready to confess it and repent of that so we don't go out of fellowship with God. That we because all of that is, is, is following that trap, that following that road to where it leads to eternal damnation as well. In verses 18 through 21, what fact, three facts should we know? Verse 18, we know what? If you're begotten of God, what do you not do? Well, that just messed my whole teaching up, didn't it? I thought we sinned, and what does he say? What does he mean? I don't continue in my sin. But he that was begotten of God keepeth himself, and the evil one toucheth him not. I don't, God, the devil doesn't win me. I don't continue in sin because what am I doing? I am correcting myself before God. First John 1, as we, we saw here. Question, uh, what's the second one? We know that what? We are of God and the whole world, where are they located? Spiritually. They lieth in the evil one. So we are we're not of the devil. We're not going to continue that. We know that we are of God, and he's our father, not the devil. He's not our father. And we know that the Son of God is what? Is come, and hath given us an understanding, and we know him that is true, and, when, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. So I'm in God, in this first part of this verse. I'm in God. I know God. And I know that he is, he's true, and we are in him that is true. And even who is that one that's true? Even the, uh, the son, Jesus Christ. So I know I don't keep on sinning. I know that I am of God and not of the world. It ought to change how I live. And we know that the son of God has come. We have an understanding. We're connected with God through his son. And what's the last thing he tells us to do? How can, what can we do to keep evil from conquering us? Guard yourselves from what? Why does a person who knows they have eternal life have to guard themselves from idols if it's all sold up? Once they'd always say. Why is that? Because that's not true. This whole Bible, New Testament, is to help the host realize 
you don't want to continue in a state because you can go into eternal damnation. And who is he talking to? He's talking to Christians who know they have eternal life. And it's the same Christians he knows. My little children. Not talking about the world. My little children. Guard yourselves from those who can take you away from God. And what are they? Idols. And what, what form do they take? It's whatever you covet. You covet money? That's your idol. You covet pride? You covet yourself? Your wisdom? That's your idol. Guard yourself from that. Because anything of that sort has the ability to take our way. Covetousness is idolatry, Colossians 3 tells us. So I have to guard myself because I know I have eternal life and I don't want to lose it. What does that do? It keeps us on guard. It, it keeps us uh, not accepting what most religions accept today about the, about concerning the security of the believer. I think we see we can have security. How we, we're going we're to keep confessing and repenting and all of those things. And we're going to keep following Christ. We're going to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so we will not stumble. The Bible is replete for the Christian who should have confidence in their salvation to know how to maintain it. So that we, every part of our life, I know I have it. And this is, I'm having to do a lot of correction. I know I have it. It's not because God chose me and he's sovereign. That's Calvinism. But it's not what our New Testament teaches. All right, that closes question uh, lesson nine. We'll get into Second John. And how long do you think we'll be in 2 John? Should be very long, should it? And we will, we will move on. So do you have any questions or things you'd like to comment before we close? Here. Yes? Well, I just wanted to comment on, on David's uh, touching of Matthew's uh, sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, basically, that, that and this and John is showing the two camps of men. Those that reject the Holy Spirit, they just reject it completely. That's in Matthew. The, the Christian speaking here in John is, is the one that has access. That yeah, they, like I said, they've been anointed by the Holy Spirit in the first epistles. That's, that's right. That's Good point. Okay, thank you for your, your comments.